The adventure continues with chapter four, Tiger Bowlegs, read by Emmanuel Bravo. Chapter four, Tiger Bowlegs. Life got a lot better after the victor, but it wasn't because of my new clothes or even the sewing machine that Papa fished out of the river. It was because of Tyler Bowlegs. A few days after the victor came apart, I was playing outside by the lighthouse when I heard a short whistle from the trees by the riverbank. I th at first I thought it was a bird, but then I heard it again. I walked toward the trees and saw a tiger of bull eggs hiding in the shadow of a big oak tree and waving toward me. I ran into the woods. It was hard talking to Tiger at first. I didn't understand him very well, so we both had to talk real slow. I asked why he was hiding in the woods, and he said he was afraid to come out where the white men could see him. I tried to tell him that he didn't have anything to worry about from Papa, Mr. Carlin, and Captain Amore, but he said, but he said that, but he said that Seminoles had been tricked plenty of times by white men. Tiger said the U.S. Army had once burned down his family banana trees in their fields of corn. This happened when the lighthouse we lived in was being built. In revenge, his grandfather led an attack against the workers at the lighthouse and the Army soldiers. This started a war and, between his tribe and the U.S. Army. It was later called the Third Seminole War. What happened? I asked. Did you win? Tiger looked fierce and stuck out his chin, but he said, no, someone will never win white men fighting. Why not? I asked. Too many guns, he replied. Tiger told me that the Seminoles and white men had been fighting on and off for many years, since before the time of his father's father, father, his father's father's father. It took me a few minutes to figure that out. He met his great grandfather, but Seminoles don't keep track of time like we do. They follow the moons instead of years. So Tiger didn't even know how old he was in years. I just guessed he was somewhere around my age. I didn't like the idea of white people fighting Indians, and Tiger said sometimes there would be whole years would go by. There would be whole years, and there would be no fighting. But then something would happen, like Big Tommy killing the white people, or the army burning a Seminole village, and then there would be a lot of killing. Are you going to kill me? I asked, mostly joking. No, you my friend. I saw Tiger pretty often after that. He and his father came to the lighthouse to trade buckskins, bear pelts, and raccoon hides for items such as clothing, tools, and various foods. One time, Papa let me come along to Tiger's village and get a load of furs. This was the first time I'd seen an Indian village, and I couldn't believe how different it was from the houses I was used to. Tiger and his family's house had no walls, a roof, and the roof was made from dried palmetto fronds. They slept on a wooden platform a few feet off the ground. He said they did this so the animals and snakes could not get to them while they slept. In the middle of the village was another big house with a fire pit in the center where everyone cooked. Once Mama and Papa learned to trust Tiger, they let us roam through the woods around the lighthouse. We explored many creeks and little rivers flowing into the Loxahatchee and Indian rivers. We camped, climbed trees, and used wild vines to swing from tree to tree, built forts in the woods, hunted rabbits, collected alligator eggs, and learned to make turkey galls so good that even the turkeys were confused. Tiger knew the woods, the river, and the animal animals better than any white man did. He taught me how to hunt, how to move through the woods without making any noise, and how to mask the human smell on my body with mud and plants so the deer could not smell us. He also taught me how to carve crab wood into perfectly straight spears. Then he showed me how to crawl out in the edges of a mangrove tree on the edges of mangrove tree branches without casting a shadow over the water. From there, we could spear the fish and the river as they swam below us. Mama said it was okay if I played with the tiger, but she also said she wasn't going to t let me turn into a little Indian. Every day, I had to sit with her in the lighthouse and study my books and learn to write. But Mama was smart. To keep me interested, she had her relatives in Chicago send books on geography, biology, and plants and animals. So, while Tiger taught me the seminal words for alligator, turtle, and river, I also learned the school words for the same thing, even the Latin words. One day, Papa walked in during a lesson. He laughed a big laugh and said I was going to think like a white man, but live like a seminal. That was one thing about Papa. He never said anything bad towards the Seminoles, and he was friendly towards Tiger and his father. He told me the Seminoles knew how to live with the land, not against it, 
and I was lucky to learn from a real Indian. I spent as much time with Tiger as I could. One of our favorite places was a large shell mountain on the other side of the inlet from the lighthouse. It was a big hill made, with old, made from old oyster shells, along with bones, arrowheads, burnt wood, broken turtle shells, and axe heads. We, we liked to climb onto the top and look out over the trees and water. Tiger taught me how to weave green palmetto fronds into mats so we could slide from the top of the shell mountain all the way to the bottom. If it had just rained and the shells were slippery, we had to jump off our mats before plunging into the river. Tiger's father once told us that the Shell Mountain was ho once home to the group of Indians who called themselves the Hope. The shells, bones, and tools belonged to the Hope, who lived there long before the Seminoles had arrived. According to Tiger's father, the Hope had kept a white man named Jonathan Dickinson and his family captive at this site after Mr. Dickinson's ship had wrecked north of the inlet. It took Dickinson and his family more than a year to escape and walk north along the beach to St. Augustine. If only on the people on board the Victor knew how lucky they were to be rescued by Papa, Mr. Carlin, and Captain Amor, rather than a band of wild Indians. About 25 years later, after my family moved away from the lighthouse, a family named Du Bois would build a large house on top of that shell mountain.